knows we traveled uh, over the past week. Go out through there, and uh, there are a lot of pictures to see. A lot of things that just a, a picture of it, uh, an image, and all of a sudden you get some information. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. And I don't doubt that a bit. When you're out traveling and you see that little sign that has a, a guy on one side and a, a girl on the other side, well, you just know that that's an exit you need to pull off on because that's where the restrooms are. <laughs> right? Oh. And, you know, you got the wheelchair. That, that's handicapped access places. They're just a whole host of things. Fork and a knife. Food. Food, right. A bed. Hey, there's a motel lodging there somewhere. But you see them all over the place, and we see them particularly that you know the computers anymore uh, if you're like me most of you are about like me my age <laughs> remember as computers came along at first computers had to have the punch cards to be programmed to type stuff out and then punch the card and put it in and give the information and all then it got to be where you could just type in the instructions and that's where I kind of got involved with them. And then it wasn't long after that they came out with the icons. You, you, you put the cursor, the little arrow, over an icon, and, and you know there's, there's a program behind there. Uh, I like Word uh, and uh, Excel uh, for spreadsheets and PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. You know, they've all got their own little symbol there that you can distinguish them. And, and you can hit on that and it opens up the program. You don't have to type anything in to get it coming up. It makes it so easy. And it just brings me to thinking about what the scripture says about Jesus. About him being the <coughs> original icon or the original image. That if you really wanted to have a picture that represented mankind in general and at the same time a picture that represented God Jesus would be that picture if you had a picture of Jesus of course we don't have pictures of Jesus uh, nothing like that's been handed down to us but if we did that's what he would be. He, he would be the original icon. He'd be what God is and what man is supposed to be. Rolled up in one. And we see that Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. He, speaking of God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption... The forgiveness of sins. He is the image or icon okay, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So, you know, everything in this universe is here for him to serve his purpose. And because of the free will that's given to mankind, and we've talked about that a good bit lately, uh, a lot of this world is in rebellion to him. We can see the beauty in this world, but we can also see the danger, and we can also see the evil. And wasn't that a terrible evil that happened last Sunday evening? Okay? Okay. Uh, you know, just a, a, a terrible, terrible thing. And evil's the only way, really, that you can describe it. That's not what God wants for us. God wants for us to be in that mold, to be in that picture, that icon of His Son, Jesus Christ. God created mankind in His, that I put slash their own image, and I didn't get all my capital letters right in there, so you can forgive me for that. 
that that we we all we we like to talk about God in the singular and you know he is a great God and such remember that Father Son and Holy Spirit each had a part in creation and we're created in their image but in particular Christ being in the image of God Jesus being in the image of God we need to be in his image because he's the prototype he's the one that we're supposed to look like so this word image comes from a Greek word the Greek word icon which you've seen the icon cameras right you know, it's spelled E-I-K-O-N that's that Greek word that's the word that's used there we are created in his icon we're created in his image we're created to to be what he looks like from Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and no I don't really recall what the Hebrew word is right off but but we're in that image God created us to be like him now that doesn't necessarily mean physically but spiritually in his image we, we need to be like him uh, doing his will looking like him and, and what he would do if he were here upon this earth how would he act how would he treat other people that's the image that we need to be in everything in this universe is subject to the laws of the universe uh, and those laws had a predecessor which means that the designer behind all design is God can you imagine having a design without a design you go out in the, in the middle of the desert and you see this formation this this stuff in the sand you know written out diagrammed here it is you know blah blah, blah. and you said gee I wonder who did that and somebody said well nobody did that it just it, it, it's just there on its own and that's the way some people talk about this universe that we have that there was no designer it's just an accident where did it come from well it, it didn't come from anyway it just it just it, it is you know and that would make it eternal though wouldn't it it can't be eternal because it's a material universe nothing of a material nature ever came into existence on its own nothing nothing just it, it had to come from somewhere now that's a material essence a material substance but spiritually God has always existed and you know guess what time is something that had a beginning time is something that's involved in this world and it has material aspects involved in it there was no time before God created this world none so it's hard for us to understand about eternity that it, it just is so every observable object every physical thing every tangible bit of matter and energy owes its existence to something that existed before it did and that's a fact of science isn't it yeah because science and the laws of thermodynamics say that that there's only so much matter in this world and there's only so much energy and as the matter kind of uh, it, it, energy and matter kind of transfer as energy is released from the matter uh, matter dissolves matter decays matter goes down but the energy is still there and there's not being there's no new matter being produced that we know of there's no new energy being produced that we know of it's it's already here because it was something that was created into this universe by that original designer the designer behind all design is our God we know that the universe is not the universe is not eternal it had a beginning time again had a point of origin it started when God created this universe so this is true whether you believe in the universe that that it's a, a billion years old or if it's a few thousand years old it doesn't matter that's where time began is at the beginning of this universe I happen to believe it was a few thousand years 
not billions of years. It looks like it's billions of years. Yeah, but if you sit down and think about it and you, you judge things according to how they are, not just how they appear, you get a different understanding of it. So uh, somewhere there had to be an uncaused cause for this universe. If this universe was caused, if it, if it had a start somewhere, there had to be something to cause it, but that whatever caused it couldn't be caused in itself. The uncaused cause, and that uncaused cause is the original icon. All things were created by him and for him, and through him all things consist. Now, the original icon can't be this universe, for then we, uh, he would be this, he would be of this universe, and it's impossible for anything in this universe to create itself. We cannot create ourselves. We can't really create anything. Everything that's out there, it, everything that, that comes into being is because we might cause it or somebody else causes it. So, uh, God, or Jesus as the Son of God, can exist in this universe that he created, uh, but he's not of this universe. And that's what John is trying to get through our heads, our thick skulls, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Without Him was not anything made that was made. So He was there before there was even time, before this universe existed, and he created it all, so he couldn't be someone who was of this particular universe, which means he has and can exist. He can and has, he has, I'm sorry, and can exist totally separate from this universe because he did, because he started from outside of this universe. He started before this universe was even created. He was all already <coughs> there as God. Consider these facts. We know that matter and energy cannot create themselves. It's just that we might find new energy. We might find different energy sources. But it's all already here. Life does not spontaneously generate from non-life. That's the law of abiogenesis. Scientists believe in the law of abiogenesis, except when they're talking about creation, and they say, oh, it just happened by itself. It did happen then. <laughs> but but that you don't see it. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, the structures within a living cell are far too complex to be accounted for by evolutionary processes. Have you ever heard of Darwin's black box? Darwin's black box? See, Darwin says that everything evolved, and that's how most scientists look at things today. It just happened, and it, it, it naturally occurred. But in Darwin's black box is something that Darwin can't explain. A mousetrap. You, you want to know what a mousetrap is. You've got the, the board on the bottom, and then you've got some mechanism there. You've got a spring, and you've got a, 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 a scandal that holds that, and then you've got the trap deal that you put the cheese on. And, you know, when the mouse comes and takes the cheese, it, you know, it's gone. But uh, that couldn't evolve. That had to have several different processes of things coming together, not growing out of one to produce it, bringing it together in order to form that mouse trap. It's just not going to form in nature. There are many things, and even with the human body, that have that same type of an example. The human eye, the eye couldn't evolve. Now we see out in the animal world, 
size, but some don't have as much uh, specificity of things, uh, like the sight and uh, the <coughs> being able to differentiate, you know, in distances and such, uh, but yet it's all such a mechanism that there's no way that that could really have evolved. And all the different systems come together and then complicate that with all the other systems of the human body. And even an animal's body would be considered the same way. So whether we want to be, or whether we want to admit it or not, we are the product of an intelligent designer. There was a design. God had something in his mind. God had a blueprint in his mind that he sat down and, and he worked all of this out and he brought it forth in a week's time. Six days of creation. God couldn't do that, could he? That, that's just impossible. You know, listen. A God who is powerful enough to raise the dead, a God who's powerful enough to do the things that the Bible says that he's done, uh, the miracles that are there, was powerful enough to create the world in six days. God could do it. And there's a whole lot of information, a whole host of information you can go out there and you look at and, and give you the thoughts that... that are in juxtaposition or uh, that uh, deny or defy what the evolutionist teaches. There's a whole lot of science out there that they have to leave behind that proves that the world could be created Everything can come about just as the Bible teaches us. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 14. Psalmist writes, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. Oh, my soul knows it very well. So we can understand it with our soul. We may not see it with our eyes. And there may be points out there that that kind of hide God's handiwork and especially to those who don't want to see it but it's there and the evidence is there well how do we get to that that point in time or the point in in the arguments the uh, how has it gotten to the point where it is now where where science is so overwhelming it seems like and our children are taught in schools and colleges that oh that that Bible that's just superstition that's just myth you you can't trust that the struggle of science I think has a lot to do with it and what science was designed now now see there's that word design science was designed to do something it wouldn't be here if it wasn't designed to do something. And there has to be design. There has to be rules and regulations that, that, that govern science or it would just be all over the place. We, we'd be back really truly to some of the superstitions of the past. But the struggle of science is easy to resolve. Science is the knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the sp operation of general laws especially as obtained and tested through the scientific method. Now, that's not my made-up deal. That's from Merriam-Webster's online dictionary. Okay? That's what the guy who knows, or the people who knows no words say, that's what that means, all right? Scientific method, that's principles and procedures for the systematic pursuit. Systematic. Systematic. You've got to have a law to study science, which when they go back, then they say, well, those laws don't apply way back there. Science changed. I'm not sure, but let's see if we can discover some of this. 
principles and procedures for the systematic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem, the collection of data through, <coughs> catch this, observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. That's what the scientific method is. You study something, and you look at it, and you say, my, I think this frog was once a dog. <laughs> and here's how I prove it. I go back and I, I draw these sketches and put it out there. Of course, we know that's not really what that means because you're supposed to observe all those things in between like they do with the monkey and the man. Well, it's being the fossil record, but don't observe that either, do we? Science can only postulate on things that are observable or empirical, the five senses. Is that true? That, that's a true statement. That's, that's the only thing that science really can testify to. So when science speculates on the creation and pre-creation or the eternal, it stops being science and becomes philosophy, which is governed by a whole entirely different set of rules. It's all right for someone to say, you know, I kind of think that that uh, the the world, you know, matter was just always there, and and it just suddenly came into life. You know, that's what I think, and and here's how I put it and formulate it out. It's all right if they want to think that. Understand, that's philosophical. That's not looking at facts. Okay, but the scientific approach is supposed to look at the facts. But in the philosophical approach, it's just as readily, or it's, it's just as correct to say, I believe that there's a God who created all of this. And that makes a whole lot of more sense to me, because that does not, uh, combat or confront what science really is saying that there's got to be some observation and uh, uh, replication of things. So, uh, science can only function in the realm of the predictable and the repeatable. So, that's why science is trying so hard, scientists are trying so hard to repeat the creation of life. They're taking materials that are already here and they're putting in a test tube or whatever and they're trying to make them come to life. They're trying to make amino acids and they're trying to make proteins and they're trying to make all this stuff, the building blocks of life. And, and they're not having much success, but the problem is they're already using stuff that's already created to try to do that. They're not doing it out of nothing like we, I hope we believe, that God did, that he created this out of nothing. So, science's greatest value, uh, it has its greatest value in observing what is and evaluating the laws within the created universe in which we live. And this helps to make life more enjoyable. And, hey, cell phones are great. Don't have to have that wire connected, you know? Uh, there's a whole lot of thing, you know, we're living in fantastic times. But that, that's because science looks at what was designed and what was uh, created and uses that to produce new things. But they're not creating anything. They're using the laws of science, the scientific method, to pursue these things and to bring them into being. So, some scientists seek to peer beyond that which science says exists in this universe. They want to look behind, like in The Wizard of Oz, see all this stuff going, but what's behind the curtain? You know, it, it takes the little doggy to go over there and pull the curtain back. And, and then, you know, of course, when that opens up, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. You know, that's what the, the scientists, many of them, but who do not believe in creation, would say. Don't believe in the man behind the curtain. Don't believe in the one who created this universe. Just take it as it is 
and work some theory out. But you know what they're doing? When they leave the realm of the, uh, of the material and the five senses and studying things, what they actually observe and what they can study and experiment with over and over, when they stop doing that and they start looking over and beyond and saying, well, you know, this is what happened before anybody was there to observe it, anybody was there to replicate it. But what they're doing is, uh, did you ever hear of, of people who would drive their automobiles so fast that they would uh, overdrive or outdrive their headlights? You know, uh, you know, they're driving down the road so fast, you know, there's a deer in the road out there, but they can't see it. You know, their headlights, you know, go out so far, but they're driving so fast that, that they just can't see it, and they're on it too quickly before they do. They can't get stopped in time, and so they hit it. They crash, whatever. And that's kind of like what goes on with these scientists. And, and you say, well, Fred, what's the proof of that? I'll tell you what the proof is. How many scientific laws, so to speak, have been changed in the last few years. In the last hundred years. Things that were said this, this, and this, and this, and this. And then all of a sudden, wait a minute, that's not like we thought it was. It's, it's different. So, things that had been accepted as fact for centuries have been changed because in the replication in the experimentation, the observation of those things, scientists have found out, no, we, we were wrong in the assumption that we made with that. Listen, I don't know. Maybe I'm not making a whole lot of sense here this morning. Maybe I've kind of stirred up some, some thoughts and, you know, where is Fred going with this? Here's the thing. If scientists are having trouble with understanding and presenting the things that are observable and they can experiment with and have been there for, for ever so long, if they have trouble with that, how in the world can they tell us about something that they haven't seen and don't even believe in? And to tell us that God doesn't exist and God didn't create this world. They can't even get the stuff that they're supposed to be doing right 100% of the time. It's like a meteorologist. Meteorologist is a scientist, right? And if they're right half the time, they keep their jobs on the TV set, right? So that's kind of what I'm talking about here. There is a value of science, and when science is done right, when science doesn't start out with the theory there is no God and there was no creation, all of a sudden you see them putting things together in the way that the universe is. And it begins to answer some of the many questions of how we got here. The design that is in this universe, the design that is in us. And it's overwhelming that we couldn't be accidents. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Our God has created us. The two current worldviews are then this. And analyze them as you would a news story. You know, you've got to be careful with news stories anymore, don't you? You've got to not only read the news story, you've got to read several, and then you've got to sort it out for yourself. You know, maybe even go and look for yourself. But the analysis of, it, of, the two, of the current world views breaks down into two simple propositions. Either God created mankind or mankind created the gods. And you've got to put it the gods there because there's so many different things and theories out there that, that people go to. It's just like it's been from the beginning, isn't it? Just like the Bible says. Psalm, one, or Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The evidence is there in the things that are observable, and you can experiment with them. 
right? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Everything out here. You know, the wonderful thing about the Psalms, it's like David's out there as the shepherd boy, and he's everywhere out in the hills. You know, he's watching the sheep, but he's looking around, and he sees a plant, and he says, God's been here. And he sees a rock, and he says, God's been here. And he sees a, 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 a nice little canyon with a little stream down through it, and it's peaceful, and it's a flowing brook, and he says, God did this. Wow. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. As we conclude, I think, Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Now, this is important. Remember that science is not philosophy. Science that uh, encroaches in the world of philosophy typically becomes a vain philosophy. Colossians 2, 8 through 10, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy, and that's, that's vain philosophy, really, and empty deceit according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Remember, back in chapter 1, he's the icon. He's in the image of God, he's in the image of man, but he created everything from outside of this universe. He was before it. So, watch that they don't fool you. That's not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So if you want to know what man should look like and act like, don't go to human beings. You know, a hundred years ago, mankind tried to say, this is what a human being should look like. This is how a human being should act. And the greatest war in the history of this world was fought because of a human tradition. Eugenics. We can make a better man than what's out there. That's exactly what Hitler was trying to do. That's what Hitler believed. And that's what truly led to World War II. And we see the same things happening today in, in, in many different ways. You want to see what man should look like? That this world would prosper and this world would be at peace? Look to the icon, the original icon. Look to Jesus. Not that, that Superman that the Nazis proposed, but look to the man that God created, that God became to show us the right way. If we want to know God, we must honor him and his revelation. Every other method or attempt to dis of discovery leads to, you know what? False gods, false religions. Only through Jesus can we find the right way. Listen, I really took up a lot of time. I, I hope you can sort through that. <laughs> Maybe find some sense out of it. Amen. But here's, here's the thing. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by we know how that is. Believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. Repent of our past sins. Change of mind. Change of the way we act. Confess Him before men. Be buried with Him in the waters of baptism. Rise to walk in newness of life. That, that's how we become like that icon, that original icon, and become the children of God. Thank you for your time. The lesson's yours. If you have need, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation.